The Apostle John's New Testament Revelation Unfolded Section 10 Chapter 12 Verse 1 And there appeared a great sign in heaven showing those things as they are upon the earth. And I saw a woman clothed in a robe as if it were the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head there was a crown of twelve stars. It has already been established that the term woman is used to represent the human race. Here John is presenting the woman as the church of God, or in other words, the group of people in mortality who wear robes, their works, filled with the light of the sun, the illumination of truth and righteousness. To guide the footsteps of the woman throughout mortality, the people have been given the prophets of God, the moon under her feet. Because John was called as a Jewish prophet and subsequently used Jewish symbolism and time frames in his expressions throughout Revelation, he presents here that the power and authority, the crown, of truth and righteousness was established through Abraham, whose lineage is the twelve tribes of Israel, twelve stars. However, this reference is purely figurative, as it has already been explained that the term 12 tribes represents all those in every culture and in every time period who keep the commandments of God. Verse 2 And the woman was with child and was crying and traveling in birth, being pained to be delivered. The righteous people of the earth who are led by true prophets of God have always been saddened, crying and traveling, living in a world that wants nothing to do with equality and love, which is the purpose of keeping the commandments of God. The prophets have prophesied of the coming of a Christ, the child, to the earth to wipe away their tears and relieve them of the pains of trying to live righteously in a corrupt world. John presents the woman with child, expressing the hope of the righteous that one day a Messiah would be sent to the earth. But until this child is delivered, the kingdom of God set up, the woman will still be crying and traveling. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil, S-I-C, that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us, this is the Lord, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah 25 verses 7 to 9 John borrows his symbolism from Jeremiah's description of the earth before it is spoiled, ruined, by the coming of Christ, figuratively asking the world what good is all its splendor and glory when it finally finds out the truth, and when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rauntest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair, Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion, that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now! For my soul is wearied because of murderers. Jeremiah 4 verses 30 to 31 Verse 3 and there appeared before my eyes another sign given in heaven in likeness of things upon the earth, and I beheld a great red dragon, which was the serpent which I saw that had power over the bottomless pit. And the serpent had seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. After the righteous who choose to live the gospel of Jesus Christ were presented in his vision as a clothed woman, John saw the cause of all the world's problems the enticements and influences of the flesh, or human nature. Dragons have been presented throughout the scriptures as those who exercise power and control over people. Throughout the presentation of Revelation, John uses the terms dragon and serpent interchangeably. Prophets have used the term dragon and owl in expressing those who unrighteously control the people with their power or supposed wisdom. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, 
The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the lion of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there, and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest, and lay, and hatch, and gather under her shadow, there shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen. Isaiah 34 verses 11 to 15, 43 colon 20 And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for she gathered it of the hire of an harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore I will wail and howl, I will go stripped and naked, I will make a wailing like the dragons, and mourning as the owls. Micah 1 verses 7 to 8 I am a brother to dragons, and a companion to owls. My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burned with heat. My harp also is turned to mourning, and my organ into the voice of them that weep. Job 30 verses 29 to 31 The dragon slash serpent that had power over the bottomless pit is figuratively given as our human natures. These are presented as a red dragon because human nature has led to the bloodshed of billions of people throughout the history of this earth. Because our natures cause us to place a greater value on our own lives than those of others, we have established nations and governments throughout the earth to protect. Horns are used by an animal for protection, our own lives in spite of what we might have to do to others. John presents this dragon as having power and control, seven crowns, over all the seven continents, seven heads, specifically noting ten kingdoms or governments, ten horns, that had not yet been given power upon the earth at the time John received this vision. See Revelation 17 verse 12. Verse 4. And with his tail he drew after him the third part of the stars which were upon the crown worn by the woman. And the dragon took the crown from the woman and cast it to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to be delivered, to devour her child after it was born. An explanation of the third part was given in the commentary on Revelation 8 verse 7. John is explaining that because people follow the tail after the flesh, they lose their spiritual power, crown, which causes them to concentrate more on the things belonging to the earth, cast it to the earth, than on those things which keep them in balance with the righteousness they once knew. According to Old Testament writings, when Moses descended down from the mount with the written word of God, he encountered the Israelites singing, dancing, and worshipping an idol they had constructed from the things of the earth. This because Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. Their fleshly desires led them to worship something they could see, feel, and touch, rather than comply with the simple commands they had received in the Ten Commandments Moses had given them. Upon seeing the corruption their flesh had desired, Moses cast the stones to the earth, giving segue to John's figurative representation of the righteous desires of the children of God, the crown worn by the woman, being cast to the earth. Before coming down from the mount, Joshua reports that instead of hearing the voices of people with broken hearts and contrite spirits, who are ready to receive the word of God, they heard another sound. It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Exodus 32 verse 18 
It is certainly much easier to follow the enticing desires of the flesh to revelry and merrymaking than it is to treat others as we would want to be treated. Why attempt personal mastery in order to overcome human nature when it's so much easier just to give in and have fun? Another figurative story involving Moses implies the imminent corruption of the people and their ability to follow the word of God when they are cast to the earth into fleshly mortality. From this story John took the figurative expressions he uses in Revelation 12 verse 4. When Moses first received his calling as a prophet of God, he had with him a rod, which term was later used by succeeding prophets to signify the word of God. When he was commanded to cast the rod to the earth, it became a serpent. Moses fled when he saw the serpent, but the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. See Exodus 4 verses 2-4. to John used Moses' experience to figuratively demonstrate the concept that when a spiritual being who knows the word of God slash the truth, the rod, is cast to the earth, it becomes a serpent slash dragon. In John's figurative representation, it is the tail of the dragon that drew away the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Therefore, it is this tail that we must catch and control. Because the natural man is an enemy of God and has been ever since he entered mortality, we have no hope of peace and happiness unless we put off the natural man and regain our crown of righteousness. We do this by keeping the commandments of God and catching ourselves by the tail and turning it back into the rod which leads us properly. To parallel his teachings, the word of God, to those which Moses received upon a mount, Jesus went up onto a mountain to teach the gospel to the people. Before Christ was born into the world to teach us by word and example what the true commandments of God were, and to reveal to us the hidden mysteries that were withheld since the beginning of time, the dragon was there waiting to dissuade us. Our flesh overcomes us, devour her child, and entices us to follow our human natures instead of doing unto others what we would want them to do to us. During the ministry of Jesus Christ, few could give up the things of the world to follow the simple message he take. As soon as he was born into the world to bring truth, the desires and temptations of the flesh, the dragon, kept the people from receiving his message of righteousness and peace. Verse 5 And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and before the dragon could devour the child it was caught up and taken unto God, and to his throne. Before those who rejected his message killed him, Christ accomplished his mission and left his testimony. In spite of the majority of the people, who choose a different God than the one of whom Christ spoke, Jesus left his example and gave the commandments of God he was instructed to give to the world. His gospel, the rod of iron, was revealed to the world. Though rejected by the majority, it was established upon the earth in both the eastern and the western hemispheres. Thus his words are verified. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold, and one shepherd. John 10 verse 16 The mysteries Jesus could have taught the people were never revealed to the world, and were kept with him, in essence, caught up, and taken unto God, waiting for the day when the mystery of God will finally be revealed. See Revelation 10 verse 7. Verse 6 and the woman fled into the wilderness, where there was a place prepared by God for her. And I saw the four and twenty elders and the four beasts standing before the woman, and it was given them that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. After Jesus Christ was rejected, because the people chose to follow their fleshly natures instead of his way of life, the gospel of truth was taken from the people. John uses the same verbiage other prophets have used in describing the pattern that people follow in rejecting the truth. 
The following passage from Ezekiel presents in his words exactly what John has presented in his own revelation. Instead of using the term woman with child, Ezekiel uses mother. Instead of crown, scepters are used. Ezekiel leaves out the term dragon. However, when his writings are read in context, little doubt is left that he refers to the desires of the flesh as the contributing factor to the corruption of the people. Both mention that the righteous are cast to the earth. Ezekiel mentions that her strong rods were broken, just as John writes of a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Both end their presentations by having the woman slash mother fled slash planted in the wilderness. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood, planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. And she had strong rods for the scepters of them that bear rule, and her stature was exalted among the thick branches, and she appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches. But she was plucked up in fury, she was cast down to the ground, and the east wind dried up her fruit, her strong rods were broken and withered, the fire consumed them. And now she is planted in the wilderness, in a dry and thirsty ground. Ezekiel 19 verses 10 to 13 Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets have referred to a wilderness as the place where people are led who do not have access to the fullness of truth. This mortal state is a wilderness, as none have access to the fullness of truth because of the veil over our minds. This veil, or inability to know all the mysteries of God, is represented by prophets when they mention the ancient people being led by a pillar of fire by night, in which a fire obscures the lights in the night sky, and a pillar of a cloud by day, in which clouds obscure the light of the sun, both insinuating that the people are being led to a place prepared for them, the promised land, without God revealing his mysteries, his light is obscured. This preset course was established as a wise way for us to experience a wilderness in comparison to a promised land. In other words, so we can experience what it is like to live without knowing and understanding truth, in order to appreciate what it is like when we do. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day, to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night, to shew them light, and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Nehemiah 9 verses 19 to 21 Thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praised thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Isaiah 64 verses 10 to 11 O oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people, and go from them. For they be all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard, they have trodden my portion underfoot, they have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Jeremiah 9 verse 2, 12, 10 When the ancient Israelites, including their leader, Moses, rebelled against God, none of them were permitted to enter into the land of promise. Joshua was the one who finally led the people into the land filled with milk and honey. Milk because the truths when unfolded in plainness are as an infant's food, and honey because these truths will be sweet to whomever receives them. This story gave a parallel of those things which occurred when Jesus, Yeshua, whose true name should properly be translated as Joshua, arrived to lead the people in truth and righteousness by giving them a manna, which if they partook, would fill them up, never to feel the pains of hunger again. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, 
but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6 verses 32 to 35 in order to parallel the message given throughout scripture of the first shall be last and the last shall be first, those who oversee the work of God upon this earth waited until the author of this book, who was called to present the milk and honey of John's revelation, reached the exact same age as the number of years Joshua had to wait until he was allowed to lead the Israelites into the land of promise. If of any interest, this author's firstborn son's name is Joshua as well, and now, Behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, Joshua 14 verse 10, and Revelation 12 verse 6. John gives an exact time of the 1,203 score days instead of the more general time period of time, times, and half of time. John uses three days and a an half, or time, times, and half of time to represent general time periods when, according to Jewish tradition and history, prophets would be teaching the fullness of the gospel to the people of the earth. When he intended to give a specific time period of a certain event, he distinguishes this time frame from the general one by using 1,203 score days. This has substantial relevance because by so doing, John gives the reader a clue about the amount of time the fullness of the gospel would be withheld after he was commanded to stop preaching to the world. This was discussed in the commentary on Revelation 11 verses 2-4. to the place prepared by God is not a physical location, but a state of mind in which those who live the gospel are placed as they do unto others what they would have done unto them. It is a place of peace, happiness, and an understanding of the fullness of the gospel. It is the place that is promised to those who keep the commandments of God and have a true testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power, and by thy strong hand. Nehemiah 1 verses 9 to 10 Verse 7 and there appeared another sign in heaven in the likeness of a war being waged both in heaven and upon the earth. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought against Michael. As explained in the commentary of Revelation 8 verse 1, Michael is the figurative expression of the Holy Ghost. The war that is presented is the constant battle between our flesh, Lucifer slash the dragon, and our spirits, Holy Ghost slash Michael. This war was explained in the commentary section on Revelation 11 verse 7. Verse 8 And at the end of the battle, the dragon and his angels prevailed not against Michael or the child or the woman, and the place which had been given to the dragon and his angels was not found any more. In heaven or on earth, we were created to experience joy and happiness in our associations with each other. In order to do this, we must overcome and win the battle between our selfish natures and the law of the gospel, which is to do unto others what we would want them to do to us. Until we can live this law, none of us will be ready to live in a world where this is required in order to maintain the peace and happiness we were promised upon creation. God did not create us to experience misery living with each other, or to fear one another, or to put ourselves above each other. We were created to overcome our flesh, which fights against our true natures while in mortality. In the end, we must overcome the flesh and learn to respect each other and live the law of the everlasting gospel of his Christ. 
Luckily, there is more than one planet that will be prepared in the future, upon which we will live forever, and experience those things that bring each of us the different degree of individual happiness we each desire. Before we are entrusted with an eternal body that will never die, we must be able to use it the way it was meant to be used to experience happiness for ourselves and maintain happiness for others. Verse 9 And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called Lucifer, the devil, who was also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out of heaven and also out of the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Isaiah puts it beautifully this way, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land, and slain thy people, the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 21 The study of the human psyche has long been an interest to those who have taken it upon themselves to analyze, scrutinize, and come up with a solution to the problems human beings experience in life. Their study and search is exhaustive and never-ending, and usually culminates in one observation. The happiness of the creature depends on its ability to reconcile itself with its own existence. This reconciliation can only be realized when the adaptation to its environment creates a balance, which is defined and recognized by human beings as happiness. If happiness is not experienced, the being cannot justify the purpose for its existence. Therefore, it continually seeks the balance of physical and emotional satisfaction by using any means at its disposal. This means is the flesh. Our innate desire for happiness, the flesh, dictates how this balance is maintained. Because our human experience appears to have a beginning, birth, and an end, death, which are the only things we know of a surety, we justify any action that will satisfy the pleasures we crave. The satisfaction of these fleshly desires is the essence of who we are, and in our minds, takes precedence over the pursuit of happiness of others with whom we share our existence. We become reconciled to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And if our eating, drinking, and merriment causes unhappiness to others, it is their problem, not ours, for we have found our balance. This is the course of the flesh, which are the truths, the doctrines, and the enticements of that old serpent, called Lucifer, the devil, who is also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Source withheld. There is only one way to conquer the flesh and cast Satan out. Make sure those with whom you associate have the same ability and means to find happiness as you do. If all beings live to make sure everyone else around them is happy, we would all be happy. In other words, do unto others what you would have them do unto you the commandment upon which all the laws of God, his Christ, and his prophets are predicated, and which, of course, is diametrically opposed to Lucifer's plan.
If we were created for our existence to end in misery, then eternal death seems justifiable. But if happiness is to be our end, and for this reason we were created, then eternal life is preferred. Verse 10 And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ to the earth, for the accuser of men is cast out, which caused them to accuse him before our God day and night. John writes of the glorious time when the whole world will finally be aware of what they can do to create an environment of peace and happiness, salvation. This can only occur when a proper leader directs according to the rule of a righteous law, the kingdom of our God. Logic should cry that unless this anointed one comes to the earth in a supernatural, spectacular way, demonstrating a power, strength, and knowledge never known before, the people will doubt his authority. When this alien visits the earth, then will the truth be known that we are not alone in this universe, and there are others who have progressed in knowledge and understanding far beyond anything we mere mortals can comprehend. Instead of speculation, hypothesis, belief, opinion, or imagination, reality will finally become the norm. Using logic and reality, how can Lucifer be the accuser of men? Accusing them of what? Of obeying the commandments of God and disrupting his earthly kingdom and glory? Does Lucifer go before God and make accusations day and night about those who do not follow him? It is quite obvious that the original translators of John's words had no clue what he was trying to say when they came up with their own interpretation of this passage. Part of the great turmoil and embarrassment that the people of the earth will experience when Christ sets up the proper government and society and reveals reality in all the glory and splendor of logic is the fact that each of them was, is, and will always be, completely responsible for his or her own actions. No longer can they accuse a being outside of themselves for the actions that caused their misery. The foolish notion of demonic possession and the devil made me do it will be cast out under the truth that we are all individually and independently responsible for what our spirit tells our body to do. However, this does not discount physical aberrations that cause mental illnesses and how they affect our decisions to think rationally. But true to the intended meaning given of the prophets for Lucifer, in these cases, it is the flesh that contributes to our aberrant behavior. The invention of a Lucifer, Satan, the devil, demons or evil spirits, and the likes, has been used by men to make accusations before God as to why they have acted contrary to his commandments. With a belief that an outside influence can direct our thoughts and actions, it is very easy for human nature to run its course uninhibited, because the being inside the body is not responsible for what it does. Conversely, in order to establish peace and happiness, one must understand that this kingdom of God can only be established from within as fast as each of us, being individually responsible, influences the acts that lead to this end. When the human race finally realizes there is no hell, except for the one which it creates for itself, and that there is no force that can take away an individual's free agency, and that we are solely responsible for how we use the bodies we have been given, we will finally have the ability to do what is necessary to create the peace and happiness associated with the term, the kingdom of our God. The power of his Christ is not enforcing us against our will, which not even God can do, so how can we believe the devil can, but is teaching us the things we need to know and understand, in order to be able to create heaven on earth ourselves. When this is accomplished, no longer will men be able to accuse someone other than themselves so much for man's accuser. Verse 11 For they have gained victory and overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony which they have borne, for they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony of the word even unto death. John is explaining how those 
who once accused Lucifer of their wickedness, were able to overcome the temptations of the flesh. Jesus counseled his disciples, and he that taketh not his cross, bear the testimony of Christ, and followeth after me, is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that lusseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10 verses 38 to 39 Before he said these words, which were directed at those of us who look to satisfy the natural urges that compel us to save our own lives, in spite of what we must do to protect ourselves from others, Christ explained that he was not on earth to provide an excuse for us in treating others badly to protect our own selfish interests. Christ taught that filial bonds, the family, create the most powerful urges of self-protection and can cause us to act contrary to the way we must live in order to experience true peace and happiness. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10 verses 34 to 37 Once we understand it's all up to us, and that there is no one else to blame for our misery and unhappiness, the accuser cast out, our desire to promote this happiness becomes extrinsic, and we begin to look for ways to increase the happiness of others which will indirectly affect our own. This is the attitude and purpose of the life of Christ. This is the essence and purpose that gave him life and caused gladness to surge through his veins as he shared his message with the world this was the blood of the Lamb. Refer also to the commentary on Revelation 1 colon 6, 5 colon 1, and especially 5 colon 9. Verse 12 Rejoice, ye that dwell in the heavens and upon the earth. And after I had beheld these things, I heard another voice saying, The time of rejoicing is not yet because the devil still reigneth upon the earth. Therefore, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and they who dwell upon the islands of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he shall be conquered, and that he hath but a short time. John gets excited relating the wonderful promise of peace and happiness we will experience in the kingdom of God once we have overcome the desires of our flesh. However, he knows the time for this salvation is yet to come and warns us to watch ourselves much the same way Jesus warned his disciples. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26 verse 41 Most see death as the end of their existence. With this mentality, we believe we have such a short time to live and experience the desires of our flesh. Therefore, it would seem logical to take advantage of the time we have left and enjoy life during this short time. Believing death is the end, the only purpose left for our lives is the satisfaction of our fleshy desires that leads us to immediate satiation of our lusts. Our human nature fights against anything that stands in the way of fulfilling the needs and desires of our flesh. We are filled with great wrath when someone or something stands in the way of the immediate gratification of these desires. We fight when either we or someone we love, is threatened. We are easily annoyed with those who appear happy, but live contrary to our belief system and way of life. There are many other ways our flesh fights for its own benefit, regardless of what we do to others. This happens because our beliefs are threatened, usually because we are not as happy following our way of life as those who live another way appear to be, i.e., the grass is always greener on your neighbor's side of the fence. Our egos take precedence over our happiness, and anything that threatens our self-validation fights with this wrath. John is warning us that our flesh, 
the devil, will continue to tempt us to remain selfish and self-centered, prohibiting us from doing unto another what we would want done unto us. This is because our flesh has convinced us we have, but a short time before death overwhelms us and conquers us. Verse 13 And when the dragon saw that he was to be overcome and cast out of the earth, he pursued the woman which brought forth the man-child to torment her. When we believe there is such a short time between birth and death, we see things with a limited perspective, which encloses our world inside a box made of our earthly experiences, limiting our reality to this box. Inside our box, we see nothing beyond what we have learned since our birth. Everything we are taught from the time we enter the world encourages us to protect our own interests, which include our immediate loved ones, who are only our loved ones because they are part of our interests. When someone we might have once loved takes his or her interests somewhere else, our selfish natures are no longer fulfilled by their existence. Therefore, we lose our love and could care less what happens to them. Likewise, we are concerned for our loved ones with much more interest than we are for our neighbors and others whom we do not love or with whom we have not shared an interest in our mortal experience. This is the natural course of the flesh and is diametrically opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The woman represents the group of people who are resolved to keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, the man-child, as he delivered them during his own mortal experience. But as these principles are taught to us, or come knocking on the enclosed reality inside our boxes, we become uncomfortable and attempt to find a way to justify our cramped reality by discounting the gospel of Jesus. We begin to pursue ways to fight, torment her, against the words of Christ. Christ taught us not to become angry or call another a fool for what he or she might do that does not agree with us. Yet when another threatens the security of our box, they are the fool because we are right. We are angered that our box was even approached, and we satisfy our flesh by fighting against any who might disagree with the living arrangements inside our box. When we are sued in a court of law by someone seeking our money or material goods, how many of us do as Christ commanded? He commanded, And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak, sick, also. Matthew 5 verse 40 If someone strikes us on the left cheek, our flesh will not allow us to take another strike, but encourages us to strike back. We judge others. We measure others. We speak ill of others. We hate and kill our enemies. We lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth, treasuring the clothes we wear, what moths corrupt, and our cars and material goods, what rust corrupts and thieves break in and steal. We do these things because our flesh has justified our actions in defense of our egos, which are securely housed in the box of our limited reality. We do nothing commanded by Jesus Christ. See Matthew 6 verses 19 to 21. John sees this battle and presents it here as the dragon, our flesh, which realizes it is only a short time to live, so in protection of its desires, it finds any way it can, pursues the woman and the man-child, to ridicule and avoid, persecute slash torment, the truths revealed to us by the mouth of Christ, which will not only bring us peace and happiness while in mortality, but will also allow us salvation in the world to come. The problem is, the dragon doesn't want us to know of the world to come, and deceives us into believing it all ends when we are dead. Verse 14 Therefore, the elders and the beasts which stood before the woman gave her two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into a place prepared for her, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, safe from the face of the serpent. 
This verse parallels Revelation 12 verse 6 in its presentation, but uses the general time frame description of time and times and half a time instead of the more specific time frame used by John in the former verse. Verse 6 speaks of the woman fleeing into the wilderness after the child was caught up and taken unto God, representing the state of emptiness and lack of nourishment, wilderness. The people of the earth would experience for a specific time period after the apostasy of the early people who once followed the commandments of Christ. Taken in context, both verses represent the constant war going on between our human natures, the flesh, and our desires for happiness the spirit here john expresses the effect that the prophets of god the elders and the unseen angels the beasts have on those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of jesus christ they have the ability to give power wings to those who listen and obey to escape the vicissitudes and torments of the flesh this has always been the case and is thus presented by John as the time periods, time, times, and half a time, in which prophets have been called and sent into the world to preach the gospel to the people. See Commentary on Revelation 11 verse 11. John borrows the expression of fleeing into the wilderness and to the land of promise, the place prepared upon eagles' wings, with the help of unseen angels, from the Old Testament, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Exodus 19 verses 4 to 5. Masterfully, John takes most of his expressions of this part of Revelation from the story of Moses and the exodus of the children of Israel into the wilderness. The part referring to the man-child being born to the woman with the dragon waiting to devour him was inspired by the biblical relation of Pharaoh's edict commanding the Hebrew midwives to kill all males born to the children of Israel. See verse 4 and 5 above. Verse 15 and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a great river after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away because of the flood. The great river John is referring to is the same one mentioned in Revelation 9 verse 14, the river Euphrates, which carried the excrement of the people who lived in ancient Babylon. This city is always used by John as a figurative expression of materialism, excess, and the things of the earth that satisfy our human lusts. As explained above, all of the desires of our hearts lead us away from treating others as our equal and doing unto them what we would want them to do to us. As we pursue the satiation of the lusts of the flesh, our houses get bigger, our closets expand, our bank accounts increase, our storage spaces increase and fill and the waste of our materialism floods our lives with obstacles that cause us to forget about anything else other than rearranging and reorganizing the contents of our boxes in which we are drowning. Furthermore, there is a deluge of poison rain coming from the clouds of darkness that blocks the light of the sun and increases the raging currents of false doctrine and precepts coming out of the mouths of the religious and political leaders causing the great river of worldly knowledge to overflow and flood our minds with the polluted water of our own excrements. The people of the earth live in the pollutions of their own doings and are drowning in their own waste, filling up the great and abominable pit they have dug for themselves with those who have dug it. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them, and my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Ezekiel 20 verse 13 Because they are drowning in the flood of their own concerns, they forget the poor and the needy, and instead concentrate more on making a car payment and sending their children to college than worrying about the homeless and deprived who are the least among them and the least thought about by them. In all these things, 
They fulfill the words of the prophets hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yeah, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned, as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Amos 8 verses 4 to 12 Verse 16 And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. As the flood of selfishness and lusts are continually rising on the sea of humanity, the effects of their works are being felt by those who do these works, and not by those who have learned to treat others equally. The latter take no interest in material goods, and live their lives in accordance with the simple words of Christ. The natural course of things, the earth, makes trouble for the inhabitants of this planet, while those who are not involved sit back with the seal of God in their foreheads, and float safely in the ark they have prepared according to the commands of God to wait out the five months of torrential rains and floods. Here, John is expressing the fact that the natural course of things always comes back and bites the hand that goes against nature. This is a natural karma, if you will, that establishes a natural law of what goes around comes around. As the people of the earth go about their lives in lasciviousness, greed, and selfishness, the earth creates an unavoidable situation in which they must pay for their actions. This natural cause and effect creates a protective shield, the earth helped the woman, for those who know better and do not participate in the lusts of the world. The righteous are sheltered, while those responsible for the earth's demise are swallowed up in their self-induced flood. Verse 17 And because the earth helped the woman, the dragon was wroth with her, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who were not drowned in the flood, and who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. People feel the effects of their own doings and cannot find a solution to their problems because their flesh, the dragon, keeps them from realizing that the answers to all their problems are in the words of Christ and his simple mandate of doing unto others. Their inability to realize this frustrates them and they blame anyone but themselves for their predicament. Therefore, it is natural for them to place the blame on those who are not involved in worldly pursuits. These worldly pursuits have become their motivation and are the essence of their existence and the true cause of all their problems. The war between the dragon and those who are saved, the remnant of her seed, from the great flood, is continual and will one day culminate in a final battle John will later present as Armageddon. This concludes chapter 12.